I work with Ed in the Infoblox IPv6 Center of Excellence, uh, which is, uh, he's a technical advisory board member for us, along with Scott Hogue, and uh, we've been doing what we can do to drag the enterprise mule to adopt IPv6, uh, and it's been a, a, a long, thankless road, but I think we're seeing some progress. Um, and the presentation that I have today, I, hopefully there, there's enough IPv6 knowledge in the room that uh, a lot of what you're going to be seeing is probably information that you're already familiar with. I'm going to try to present it in the context of how an enterprise sees uh, address planning, both in terms of how we recommend address planning as a, as a first step that enterprises can take, and then along with the sort of principles that go along with address planning that enterprises sort of have to become comfortable with in order to make sure that their address plan is something that's going to work for them more long term. Um, so, and in addition to that, I have a number of, uh, well, at least one digression that uh, I hope isn't too distracting, but um, I've presented these, I have to apologize to Ed and Scott, they've seen many of these slides uh, over and over again, and so uh, I tr try to throw something new in to make it a little more interesting for, uh, for, my, for my closest colleagues. Uh, but as we go through it, hopefully, uh, if you have questions related to uh, anything that I talk about in the presentation, uh, please you know, feel free to ask later or offline. Um, it, it's really coming from a place of, you know, what's the best way to inspire enterprises to move forward with IPv6 adoption, uh, to commit to an IPv6 adoption initiative, and the, one of the biggest feet in the door, as it were, is uh, the IPv6 address plan, something that uh, every organization, whether it's an enterprise or a service provider or anyone else, is going to need when they start thinking about how to adopt IPv6. Again, uh, these are not... Con these shouldn't be controversial ideas for the folks in this room. Uh, I certainly hope not, but if we have any, uh, any contrarians in here, I'd love to, to have that discussion around this basic idea. Uh, and, and it was actually, uh, I, I, I kind of want to just give a shout out to Jeff Doyle. Uh, it was the Texas V6 task force meeting a few years back, I think in the 2013 range. It was actually before I wrote the book, and uh, Jeff was talking about uh, the amount of IPv6 address space that we have at our disposal to assign to organizations. And he was providing, an, um, uh, we've, seen, we've all seen a lot of analogies to sort of compare IPv4 to IPv6, and I'll be putting one up on the screen here in a moment. But Jeff had a, a statistic related to the consumption of slash 48s, which is a pretty good metric for how we're consuming IPv6, uh, since we can't really think in terms of host addresses, as we'll see in a moment. And uh, the, the idea that even with the consumption metric of a slash 48, the existing global unicast allocation by the year 2100, and Jeff, you can correct me if I get this wrong, but the, the statistic was by the year 2100, there would still be enough slash 48s to give the population of planet Earth, which at that point should be somewhere around 15 billion people, to give them all 2200 slash 48s out of the existing uh, slash three global unicast allocation, which of course is only 12.5% of the overall IPv6 address space. So <clears throat> what that, speaks to is that there's a certain, uh, you know, and that, that, so that statistic just, you know, it was like made, sort of made a light go on over my head where I'm like, okay, I've been talking to a lot of enterprises about IPv6 adoption, getting them inspired to try to tackle what they need to tackle that's explicitly going to affect their business. Um, and some of those, you know, the, the, the arguments that we make to enterprises are very much about risk management. You're already running IPv6 internally. You're not really managing it effectively. It's running on all your desktops, all, your, all the mobile devices that people bring in. It's preferred by default. You need to manage that. You need to get, a whole, get your arms around IPv6 running on the network, have some visibility into it, and effectively manage it. The second sort of implicit argument is that you probably have folks that are trying to access your content over, coming from IPv6 devices. You cannot guarantee. You, you can't prove a negative. You can't show, uh, for instance, that, that somebody is not experiencing uh, a limit to their user experience accessing your content uh, if you've made it available over IPv6. But you can sort of infer that if you have a, uh, a, a competitor who has made their content available over IPv6, then you've removed from the equation the possibility that an IPv6 device attempting to connect to IPv4-only content might experience some uh, user experience degradation, some decrease in the, the user experience, and therefore accrue a competitive advantage to your competitor who's running their content, making their content available over IPv6 at the same time as IPv4. So as you can imagine, these aren't s super compelling arguments for enterprises. It, it, you know, it, it's not a situation where you know, if, you, if you don't adopt IPv6 tomorrow, you're going to show up at work and the network's just going to be down or offline. 
but they are compelling enough arguments that we have a significant number of enterprises based on those types of implicit arguments related to V6, the value of V6 adoption that they're thinking, okay, well, what are the best first steps? And so one of the first things that they run up against is, well, I've got to go out and get IPv6 address space. Obviously, if I'm going to run IPv6 in the network, and they start to get their minds around that they're going to be running global unicast allocation, that they may be running uh, publicly addressable, uh, publicly available addresses within the, the corporate land, that sort of thing. Those are sort of longer term issues for them to look at, but the very thing that the first thing that they'll need to be able to do is go get an IPv6 allocation and start to figure out what they're going to do, how they're going to carve it up. And right away, this is just this is the this is the moment where they uh, almost inevitably, at least in the early days, would make a fatal error based on this concept right here, that there is no practical equivalent to address conservation in IPv6 as there is with IPv4. And when I say address conservation, I'm speaking specifically of host address conservation. So here's uh, the de rigueur IPv4 to IPv6 analogy. The limits of the adjective astronomical. So you know, somebody says, well, how big is the IPv6 address space? You say, well, it's astronomical. It's an easy adjective to sort of toss out there. Um, it's not sufficient to the purposes of describing the size of the IPv6 address space, as we'll see. So if you do the uh, calculation, you start with an average size galaxy, such as the Milky Way. We, I've been told that it's average size. Um, I think our, our, our new dear leader will assist, insist that this is, the, this is the best galaxy, and it's, it's huge, and we don't, you know, we're going we're gonna to be the best galaxy that we can be with our 400 billion odd stars. And then the number of galaxies that we have estimated in the universe I don't imagine that somebody's actually gone out and counted this, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of two trillion. And this was actually revised upward recently, so it's a big fat error in my in my IPv6 address planning book, where I think I have a different number of galaxies in the universe here, which affects the calculation, as we'll see. So doing a little bit of uh, division here, I'm going to take the total size of the IPv6 address space, 3.4 times 10 to the 38th, the total number of host addresses that are available, and I'm just going to divide that into the number of what, what would appear to be, by this estimate, stars in the universe. And as you can see, you, you're left over with 430 trillion times more addresses than there are estimated stars in the universe. So, so astronomical as an adjective to describe the IPv6 address space doesn't really work. But this is, this is incredibly impactful in terms of uh, when enterprises start thinking about getting an IPv6 allocation and start thinking about how they're going to carve up that space, uh, they immediately are thinking in terms of how they've done everything in, in the world of V4 in the past. And we'll see some specific examples of that uh, going forward. But here's the early enterprise IPv6 adopter. He shows up at uh, one of the regional internet registries or Bob's ISP and lawnmower repair. And he's really excited because he's beat the rush. And you know, this is like 2010 or 2011, back when we were deploying IPv6 at Limelight and trying to figure out how to get enterprises excited about connecting to IPv6. Nobody really cared except for a few. But the early enterprise adopter, he gets his slash 48, and he's off to the races, right? Because, man, that's, that's a huge amount of address space. <laughs> right? Yeah, double, double, slash 48. So it's an uncontroversial fact, right, that slash 48 is certainly more than enough address space to number your enterprise. But then so is, slow, so is a slash 64, right? Or slash 80, or even a slash 96. You can have an entire internet for your enterprise with a slash 96. But of course, the rule is that we're not supposed to subnet to the right of the, the 64 bits, right? So as much as, I, as, much as we make a, a fuss about an analogy showing the comparison of IPv4 to IPv6 in terms of number of host addresses, the reality is with v6, we're, we're cutting the address space right in half, right? And we're, in terms of routing and in terms of numbering, we're just going to take half of those addresses and we're not even going to consider them. We're going to think in terms of the prefixes rather than the host addresses. So here's a quote on the Unix philosophy that I dug up on the internet. And if that's true, so if you're used to making do with a slash 8 in your enterprise or multiple private address ranges, then a slash 48 gives you enough rope to get to the moon a billion times. It's quite a bit of address space. <laughs> But here's the problem. Um, we can assert all day long that <clears throat> you've got more than enough address space to address your enterprise. And clearly, that would be the case if somebody just handed you a slash 96. You'd be off to the races. 
but this pernicious fear of wasting host addresses that comes out of the survival mechanism that we had to deploy back in the 90s when John was talking about you know, coming up with IP next generation. And what are we going to do in the meantime? Well, we've got this VLSM hack. We've got CIDR. Instead of just handing out 8s and 16s and 24s, which if you think about it from a routing standpoint, from an address planning standpoint, from an operational standpoint, is actually pretty cool. If I have a block of addresses that represents a particular location or function, you know, if I can assign, if I can just throw a slash 16 at, at a particular site and know that in perpetuity that site is always going to be reachable through that slash 16, there, there's a, a relative amount of power. And of course back then, router CPU was very expensive and so uh, it made it a lot uh, easier and cheaper to route those blocks if you could, uh, if you could keep everything on, that, on those, those uh, octet boundaries. But, of course, the horse left the barn because we were just running out of V4 space. We needed VLSM, and we needed to make sure that we weren't using IP addresses inefficiently. And so when we, when we use the word inefficient in the context of IPv4 and, and addressing, we're thinking in terms of efficiency is represented by the number of, of addresses that we're consuming. And that's the IPv4 thinking problem. So the single biggest risk to an enterprise that's coming to IPv6 for the first time and doesn't necessarily know what they're looking at yet is the IPv4 thinking. I can't waste host addresses. So there's really no host address conservation. Uh, it's, not, it's not an operable concept in IPv6. And we'll see why here in a moment. So I, I have to allocate by single bits. I'm so used to doing VLSM that I'm going to just peel off a single bit and I'm going to you know, make sure that I carve down my subnets to a size where I don't waste any addresses. Well, in v4, we have, or v6, we have the concept of nibble boundaries, which uh, allow us to do some organizationally and operationally powerful uh, things when we're dealing with managing the network IP space and, and managing the network that, that that's, it's actually addressing. And then, of course, I must make do with whatever initial allocation size that I got from the ISP or the regional internet registry. So it, it, most enterprises, and we'll see this later in the presentation, they don't have a, a history of interacting with the rears directly. Their larger enterprises do. They may have gone out and gotten uh, IPv4 blocks in the past. Um, in many cases, the organization's big enough. If, if, if you're not a service provider, you just usually, from my experience with enterprises, they just don't have a, a solid background of working with the regional internet registries. And so, <clears throat> as a result of that, they're, they're more inclined to just think in terms of the quantity of IP addresses that they got, either from the ISP or the rears, sort of this um, non-fungible quantity. They have to work with what they have. <coughs> So an allocation large enough to fit your best design, to fit a design in IPv6 that's, that operationally makes sense for what your network looks like and what you're trying to accomplish with operational efficiencies in the network, if you realize that you don't have an IPv6 allocation that's large enough to be able to do that, then you simply go back to the regional internet registry and you get a larger allocation. So this is not something that you can really do with IPv4, right? And in most cases, enterprises, they're using private address space. They can start doing strange things with VRFs and in the data center, do things like VXLAN, stitch things together, do sorts of, you know, all sorts of natting and bizarre things to try to extend the life of the, the, the private addressing, but it doesn't typically work very well. So the, probably the best example of how IPv4 thinking is impactful uh, to the enterprise admin who's come to the IPv6 address planning part of IPv6 adoption has to do with what we do with interfaces in IPv4. So, you know, if I can, if I have a data center and I've got some servers that are running on a segment and I can just throw a slash 24 at that segment, you know, that makes me pretty happy because I've got, I've got a, a, a consistently sized block and I've got 254 available host addresses and I know I can number up to about you know, 192 of those, and then I'm at 75% utilization, and I have to start thinking about, okay, am I going to expand the, the assignment that I've made on that interface? Am I going to peel off another bit, uh, allocate a slash 23, for instance? Um, usually it's the, 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 the opposite of that, where I've got a smaller subnet, I've got a smaller number of servers, and I want to carve that subnet down to the point where I'm not wasting any address space. But if, assuming that I could consistently use 24s, that's pretty operationally efficient because I've got a tidy boundary for ACLs or any routing summarization that I might need to do. That's not as much of an is issue today as it has been in the past. And I've got some room for growth on the segment. But of course, that's not how things work in the real world. One segment might have eight hosts, and then I'm like left with this exercise of, hmm, what do I do? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use VLSM because I don't wanna waste host addresses. IPv4 consumption, it, it's, you know, the efficiency of, of IPv4 addressing is measured in terms of how many address, host addresses I don't waste. 
So 57% utilization if I put a slash 28 on that segment. If I have 30 hosts, option one is I can do a slash 27, give myself, I've got no room for growth on that segment, but that's quote unquote maximally efficient for that segment. Now I've used all of the addresses available in that particular subnet. Of course, if I want to add additional subnets or additional servers, rather, I have to do a secondary address scenario or I have to re renumber the segment. Option two would be I give myself a little more room for growth, but then theoretically I'm not as efficient, quote unquote efficient, because now I'm setting aside a large number of host addresses that are just not going to be used. Same exercise with 119 hosts, but you get the idea. VLSM, and this is, this is what we've had to do for 20 years, right? So because we haven't had the address resources to be able to number the, the network in the way that, that makes the most operational sense, we've had to do this constant exercise of carving down subnets to make sure that we don't overconsume IPv4 addresses that are in scarce supply. Well, what happens in IPv6, right? Everything just gets a slash 64. Up to the far beyond the limit of what, what I'm allowed to do uh, in terms of mapping layer two to layer three addresses based on the amount of memory that I have on the routing device or the switching device. So this IPv6 interface assignment exercise then, every LAN or VLAN gets a slash 64. But uh, this is the, the other point that's worth making in abundance. Again, uh, it doesn't matter whether I use eight hosts or 30 hosts or 2,000 hosts or 10,000 hosts or a million. If I, could, if I could somehow put a million servers on a segment and know that the layer two to layer three mapping wouldn't fall over on the, the hardware side, I can't do that, but if I could, is there really any numerical difference between uh, having eight hosts on a segment, dividing that number by 1.8 times 10 to the 19th, versus having 10 million hosts on a segment and dividing that same number by 1.8 times 10 to the 19th? Because that's how many host addresses I have available in a slash 64, right? And there's, there's, no, there's no difference. I mean, those are, you know, you're talking about a, a long string of zeros to the right of the decimal place before you get to the interesting numbers. So this is, the keenly felt, and the, when I noticed it, the first time I noticed it was deploying IPv6 at Limelight when it came time to do the point-to-point uh, um, -point -point links, right? So the point-to-point -point links caused a, a great deal of consternation <clears throat> because at the time, the recommendation was there was still some debate about whether or not we should be using a slash 127 or a slash 126 versus a slash 64 and a point-to-point -point link. It, what, it had not, that debate had nothing to do and still has nothing to do if anyone wants to have that discussion about whether or not to use a slash 127 versus a slash 64. I'll be somewhere else having a drink while you're having that discussion. But if, <laughs> it's, still, it's still a debate, apparently. It still gets brought up occasionally. Uh, but the reality is when, when I had to deal with it in addressing a large globally sized IP backbone, uh, br the, the vendor that we were using at the time had come up with a fix for the the, the security risk of running a slash 64 on a point-to-point -point link, which is basically that you can, a couple of different attacks that you can do. You can exhaust the neighbor discovery cache and cause the interface to go down. And of course, we don't want that in our, our big, beautiful IP backbone. We can't have interfaces going down. But at the time, Brocade had fixed that particular problem. So I was perfectly able to configure a slash 64 on a point-to-point -point link, setting aside a slash 64 on a point-to-point -point link. Well, in the context of wasting addresses, you know, this is, this, is cold, this is cold break into a cold sweat time if you're used to only configuring, say, a slash 30 or a slash 31, if you, have, you, know, if you could support that in your hardware. Uh, it's, it's very nerve wracking to think about putting a slash 64 on a point to point link. Of course, loopback interfaces go to slash 128. So the limits of IPv4 address planning then that we bring with us, that enterprises are bringing with them as they move into, uh, into IPv6 is there's never enough addresses, right? There's never enough you never have enough host addresses. You never really have enough prefixes or network bits in order to be able to do some interesting things like track your network from an operational standpoint in terms of where prefixes are assigned. I, I don't know, I, I, when I first got into doing the address planning thing for V6, I had to think back about you know, where was I working when I realized, oh cool, I've got this 10 slash eight and I, I, I've got this second octet and I can, I can map some location into there, right? I've got, I've got eight bits to play around with, and I'm like, that's pretty cool. I can take that second octet and I can make it so that that makes, this is data center one or data center two or whatever. So you start off down that path, and then 
I've only got the eight bits. I've only got 254 possible values in that location. And the same thing goes for the third octet. And so before you know it, you're painted into a corner where you just don't have enough bits. You don't have enough prefixes unless you want to peel off an additional 10. And then, of course, you've got overlapping space. You certainly can't do it with public address space. You just don't have that kind of, uh, you know, most enterprises, unless you're like an old school, you know, HP or whatever, sitting on a couple of slash eights back in the day, you couldn't really pull that off. Um, well, even then, you're still only dealing with um, the number of network bits that, that, that you get out of a slash eight. So it doesn't, what that then prevents you from being able to do is easily mapping hierarchy into your address plan. So as we'll see, it's easy to get carried away with that. I mean, you can definitely do too much of the kind of, um, assignment of function and location into the network prefix that causes you then causes your address plan to then become very rigid and not necessarily scale very well. But it's not even possible in v4 uh, in most instances where you have the standard complement of IPv4 addresses to play with. With v6, however, you've got unlimited host addresses and sufficient bits on the network side of the address to accommodate whatever network structure you want to represent for operational purposes. So that should be it's, it's a very powerful a tool to be able to use to apply to your network operations, whatever they happen to look like. So then some basic principles that come out of that in terms of planning that we try to relate to enterprises as they start off with their, their V6 address plan. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned it later in the presentation, but I'll just go ahead and sort of throw it out there now, which is that uh, you've got sort of a chicken and an egg problem with, an, with the initial IPv6 address plan that, that an enterprise is going to use because they need to have enough information about how big their network is and how to think about the size of their network in the context of IPv6 in order to be able to make some decisions about how large of an allocation they need. If they don't do that properly, they end up with too small of an allocation and then they have to redo the address plan. It's pretty normal to have to redo a V6 address plan, at least a couple, at least from my experience, a couple times. Part of the reason I wrote the book was to try to help enterprises reduce the, number, the amount of iteration that they had to do when they did the address plan. But they will still need some basic principles to do the initial address plan to determine the size of allocation that they should really be asking for. Because a proper V6 address plan requires a sufficiently large IPv6 allocation. So the most important v6 subnet sizes when you're doing this uh, this sort of assessment up front is just the organizational allocation, which is the overall size of you know the largest v6 block that you're going to get. Site assignment, which would be how many sites do I have in my my enterprise? And these are typically when we say sites in general, we're thinking in terms of sites that are maybe connected together over MPLS WAN, sites that are geographically diverse um, or dispersed rather and that I'm going to have to determine a sort of address plan that ha it's sort of an, what, what you just to sort of make a routing protocol analogy, it would be the, uh, the inter-area address plan versus the intra-area address plan. So how those sites connect together and how many network, how many V6 network prefixes I'll need in order to address those sites. And then interface subnets. Within each site, I've got some block of interface subnets that I can assign. And I can still do hier hier hierarchical planning uh, using those uh, <clears throat> using that range from where I assign the site, the, the inter-area plan versus the intra-area plan, the number of bits that I have left over once I've assigned a block to a particular site. And then, of course, the allocation type, right? So provider assigned, get it from an ISP, it's typically best for single home networks. <clears throat> and this is, this is a block of address space that you do not own and would have to give back if you were to change ISPs. So we've got the provider that uh, we've got the customer that decides that they're going to switch, and then they have to turn over their their provider assigned address space. And unless they want to use something like uh, network prefix translation v6 and use uh, ULA on the inside of the network, and for a small single homed enterprise, that's okay. They can do that and get away with it. If you have more than one site, in general, the the recommendation is that provider uh, out aggregated addresses are not going to work. Provider assigned addresses are not going to work. Rather, you need provider independent, which you get from a regional internet registry. So these are portable. So no matter where you decide to connect, what ISP you decide to connect to, you'll always have that block of addresses. And so, of course, we're recommending to enterprises get a provider independent allocation from the regional internet registry. Uh, and, and in general, these are medium to large size enterprises. But we're saying, and if they haven't already done it, because men, many have, and in some cases gotten too small of an allocation, but we recommend make sure that that address space is portable so that no matter what happens down the road, you do this address plan that you're doing today, you can guarantee that you'll have 
it's going to endure through whoever you decide, decide to use as a provider down the road. So how big should an organizational allocation be then for most enterprises? Between a, a slash 32 and a slash 44. And that's just based on uh, the, the, the simplest calculation or the simplest assessment rather of how many sites do I have? If I have more than one, a slash 48 is not large enough of an allocation. It's just that, that basic metric. So then, and then if I think in terms of nibble boundaries, right, I, I'm thinking in terms of these sort of ungranular buckets of 16, 256, 4096, and 65,000. And so then if I think in terms of getting an allocation based on the number of sites that I have, I can use that sort of guideline of the nibble boundary. If I have, do I have more than one site? Well, I'll need at least a slash 44. That gets me up to 16 slash 48 so that I can play around with. And then I can think in terms of like the way Aaron thinks in terms of utilization, which as a rule of thumb works well enough, is 75% utilization of around the time that I want to start thinking about getting more space. So if that's the case, then if I have more than 12 sites, then I should immediately be jumping up to the next uh, nibble boundary, which is the slash 40, the slash 40, which gives me 256 slash 48s. If I have more than 200, and, if I have more than 192 sites, then I'm up to a slash 36, which is 4096, and so on, up to 65k. So, <clears throat> if you are looking at your network as an enterprise, and you're thinking in terms of the number, the total number of sites you have, and you're and you're applying this basic sort of logic. <clears throat> you have to be comfortable with the idea that a slash 48 is assigned per site within the organization as a sort of minimum uh, allocated size. Now, you, you can certainly use, uh, you could certainly use a prefix between a slash 48 and a slash 64 to assign to a site, but there's a reason why, um, in general, a slash 48 per site is, is I generally recommend it to, to enterprises. Uh, especially for inter-site address planning, where I'm looking at sites that are geographically dispersed. And I might have a data center that today goes through, you know, goes over an MPLS WAN to an internet head endpoint that's in another location. But tomorrow, I might want to take that same da data center and plumb it directly to the internet. I can only do that if I've assigned a slash 48 to that site. I can only directly route to the internet because the slash 48 is the smallest routable prefix in v6 land. So in general, I, I make that recommendation, and it, these, are, these are rules of thumb. Again, there's no law that says you can't assign something smaller than a slash 48, and as we'll see in the, the, uh, the case study that I'll show later with an actual enterprise, you can certainly assign larger than a slash 48 to a site. Yeah, you had a question? Or? Effectively, your, your point, I'll yeah. hit that same constraint and remap the numbering from a slash like 52 to a 48, yeah. So just fit the bullet, Texas, my friend, you know. Exactly. And, and that, but there, it, it, the revolution in thinking shouldn't be understated there, right? Because it, it's very nerve wracking to be like, oh crap, I don't have enough bits here. So I just need to do more subnetting, right? That's just the automatic impulse that we have from V4. Well, I'll just carve it up into a smaller block. And that's fine, it works. Um, but you, as we'll see in a moment, you, you lose the tremendous uh, sort of operational uh, visibility into the network that you get out of having these prefixes that are assigned on nibble boundaries. So what constitutes a site in IPv6? It's a logical construct. You need a definition that makes operational sense for your organization, for your enterprise. There isn't, uh, you know, you could have asked John when he was up here, hey, what's, the, uh, what's Aaron's take on what is a site? Silence, right? There's no, as far as the regional internet registry is concerned, they're not going to define a site for you. You're going to define a site as to what makes operational sense for your network. And it can be based on network topology, routing, security policy, uh, whatever you, you would like it to, uh, to, to represent. And in fact, networks seem to be flattening out in some instances where there isn't necessarily a whole lot of routing hierarchy necessary anymore because of the processing power that's available now in routers. Uh, so you may not be concerned about something like routing summarization. Your network may be relatively flat. But that doesn't mean that you still can't take advantage of the idea of having a prefix represent a certain location. From an operational standpoint, that's really powerful because if DNS goes away for some reason or if somebody misconfigures it, you know, you know if, you, if you have an operational background troubleshooting networks at the IP layer, then you're used to looking at prefixes and you're used to asking the question, where does that prefix live? Well, with V6, I can assign a prefix to a particular location and with the capacity of that prefix, I know that that's the last assignment that anyone will ever make on that network for that particular location or that segment because there's no reason I'll ever have to number into a larger prefix. I'm giving myself a large enough prefix up front. So it's based on what maximizes operational efficiency. 
So, uh, so the site slash 48 concept, they, you can get a larger or smaller allocation depending on what makes operational sense. But again, address conservation in the, in the form of host addresses is not a consideration. And if you don't have enough 48s for the plan that you've come up with for your, inter for your enterprise network, then you just go back to the regional internet registry and you get a larger block. And the story is that the, the rear is holding contiguous bits in reserve. So if I went and got a slash 32, then there's a slash 31 waiting for me or potentially a slash 28, and that's a contiguous range. So then I'm not having to have you know, a block that potentially has, and not that in, in some cases that will work depending on how your network's configured, but in some cases you want that contiguous space. So here's some examples of IPv6 sites. <clears throat> That's an actual German fire truck in the lower right-hand corner. But that's actually based on uh, the fact that I don't remember which canton it is in Germany, but they have, it might, it might actually even be nationwide. I have to go back and look. Uh, but they use uh, mobile IPv6, and they're using a slash 48 per fire truck, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> but uh, the, the most ridiculous example, of course, is the one above that. Get your, you get your hurricane electric tunnel, have your slash 48 routed over the tunnel to your laptop, so you have your whatever that is, 1.2 times 10 to the 24th addresses on routed to your laptop over a single connection. Um, but that's how, that's how Hurricane Electric d decided to define uh, how they were going to consume a slash 48 per user, and they got a large enough address allocation to be able to support that without any pushback from the rear. So if we do subnetting strictly on nibble boundaries, then again, here's this example of the very sort of ungranular buckets that we get, and then we have to think in terms of how we're, whatever we're assigning prefixes to in terms of the entities that represent our network, whether it's geographical sites in the form of you know, campus headquarters or corporate lands or uh, regional offices or data centers or whatever that might be, <clears throat> whatever those entities are that we've identified and that we want to uniquely identify with a prefix, a network prefix in V6, as long as I stick to that nibble boundary, I have an unambiguous representation of where that particular function or location, that entity is on the network. And then I just think in terms of how many of those entities do I have? For inter-region uh, inter planning, then it's typically, this is the, the assessment that we would use. And as I described earlier, depending on the consumption, the number of sites that you have, you would make your allocation assessment based on that. And then within the site, so this would be the intra-area planning, and, and this is, as we'll see in the case study, uh, some organizations are really concerned about laying out the hierarchy, other ones aren't. So you might have a site and you might just monotonically start assigning slash 64s out of the slash 48 that you have available. That might be likely in a data center scenario. Or you might have a multi-tenancy data center where you want to actually have some hierarchy based on the tenants that you have and being able to separate out that space both from an operational standpoint and from a configuration standpoint. But they make the prefix more legible. So if I have a subnet that's in, in a multiple of four in V6, then it's very clear that I have a range that starts, as you can see there, with those, uh, those final five hex tets. Um, it's very consistent, and I can look at that prefix and know specifically what slash 48 I'm looking at. As soon as I peel off another bit and move away from that nibble boundary, then I end up, well, that didn't line up. So you should be looking at the first character to the right of the, the colon one colon, and you can see that. I could have a slash 49, and I would have to expand out um, the rest of the network address in order to know which half uh, I was looking at, which slash 48 I was looking at. And that becomes operationally somewhat more ambiguous, so not as, not as advantageous. So then I can take location and function and map it into my site, into my prefix uh, at my site. <clears throat> and so here's just a simple example of, say, take, take the first nibble break it into slash 52s, I have 16 slash 52s, and then each of those slash 52s, I can jump immediately to the interface level and give myself 4,096 slash 64s that I can assign out. Of course, I could carve it up differently if I wanted to. I could have 16 slash 52s, and each of those 16 slash 52s would give me 16 slash 56s. So depending on what the security policy looks like within my site, you know, maybe I'm carving things up according to what will make the tidiest ACL entries. But I've got the ability to do that as long as I stick to the nibble boundary. I mean, I've, clearly I can do it if I don't, but it, it just makes it easier to read and easier to track um, in, uh, in V6 land. So that's mapping function and location based on, say, within the site. I've got a different building here. I assign a slash 52 to each of the buildings, and then I'm off to the races with 4,096 VLANs per building. That would be one way to do it. It's just one example. 
Well, at the end of this at the end of this exercise for for most enterprises when they first start off with V6 is if they if they if they start learning about these principles generally the what happens is they realize that you know 64 per interface slash 48 per site nibble boundaries using PI space and it's like oh crap I didn't get a large enough allocation the guy that got the the early adopter that got the slash 48 he's like I don't have enough address space to make my IPv6 address plan operationally effective. Um, I can certainly make do with the space that I have, but I can't take, I can't leverage this ability to map function and location into the prefix. Um, and, and I may have done strange things with the subnetting just because I'm paranoid about using too much IP address space. So enterprises, as I mentioned before, they don't have a history of going directly to the rear to get address space. So it's not something that they're necessarily comfortable with doing. So when I have this conversation with enterprises to talk about IPv6 adoption and the address plan, uh, there's a lot. There's generally a lot of handholding related to say reaching out to Aaron, and there's a lot of fear and uncertainty about the block that they'll be able to get. Well, I'm afraid to ask for you know I can't ask for a slash 36. That's crazy. That's so much address space. They're not going to give it to me. You know I have to like guide them to the point where they're comfortable with the idea that Aaron doesn't have a vested interest in denying them the amount of space that they need to make their their network addressing plan operationally efficient. Quite the opposite, and in fact, you know, John is is very uh, assiduous about saying it's the community, it's the Aryan community that's setting these policies. But there's a lot of leadership that comes from folks like John who have insisted that the goal is to grow, help grow the internet, help make the internet, you know, the promise of V6 of having you know essentially unlimited addressing, and to be able to leverage that to whatever the internet ends up looking like tomorrow, setting aside whether that's a horror show for security reasons, just getting everything online. Uh, Aaron's done a, a really good job of, of making sure that they're not the bottleneck in terms of providing uh, the IPv6 address allocation that enterprises need. So here's the digression that I mentioned earlier. There's a, related to V6 address planning, there's a peculiar, anybody know who this is? Anybody recognize this, this character? Either based on the, the snippet of the proof that's up there or the, or the photo? Cantor. Cantor, who said that? Yeah, if I had a, I have my book, maybe I'll give you a copy of my book as a, a prize. Um, yeah, G Georg Cantor, the Swiss mathematician. So I, I like to look at IPv6 address planning as a very special case, a corner case of innumeracy in the realm of STEM, right? So we all pride ourselves on being relatively facile with technology and science, engineering and math, math in particular. But this, v, this V6 address planning thing, when you're used to doing VLSM and used to carving up subnets ad infinitum ad nauseum to prevent the waste of address space, you sort of, you end up with this sort of Stockholm syndrome where somebody comes and takes your cage away, you're in a cage with v, V4, they take the cage away and then you're still like, you know, just walking around in a tight circle because that's what you're used to. So it's a very, it's a very sort of specific form of enumeracy. And this, it, it made me think of this early form of, uh, of what I would call uh, educated and, and high level enumeracy on the part of somebody that literally redefined the way in which we look at very large numbers and, and in fact infinite numbers. So that proof that's over the left, the snippet of the proof is Cantor's proof of the, what he calls the uncountability of the, of the irrational numbers. So he had this, and, it, and I can show this to you on a cocktail napkin uh, later on while other folks are having the debate over slash 64 versus slash 127 on the point to point link. But it's really cool because you could, even as a layperson, if you don't have a math background, you can still understand the way that Cantor lays it out. So he, he goes through this exercise of, of taking a lar an infinite set, which he just calls the counting integers, and he says, hey, if I can map the counting integers to these other number sets, then they're the same size. And so he, he shows that it's possible with the, but it produces these very strange in, non-intuitive results in that the counting set of, of infinity is the same size whether I'm looking at all the counting integers or whether I'm only just looking at the odd counting integers or the even counting integers or the primes. There, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence I can make, make between the counting integers and the non-counting integers. Um, and he does this with, with the real, he does this with the um, counting integers, he does it with the rational numbers he does this really clever thing where he takes the rational numbers and lays it out as a huge graph of fractions that just extends infinitely to the right and infinitely down. And then he just takes an arrow and he draws it through all of the, the fractions in a way to cover them up to show that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the counting integers 
and the, the rational numbers. Then he tries to do the same thing for the irrational numbers, and he gets this result. And, and I can show it to you later if you're interested, but the gist of it is that he says, I see it, but I don't believe it, because it's totally counterintuitive to say, I've got this infinitely large set, and then somehow the irrational numbers are larger than an infinitely large set. Uh, and then he shows the same thing with the real numbers. Well, actually, it gets complicated after that. He doesn't show the same thing with the real numbers. But so this sort of very weird high-level form of numeracy that we're sort of laboring with. And that, but you know, we shouldn't feel bad about it. I mean, this, this shows you why. <laughs> now, I, I don't know. So I, I, now I'm going to digress even further away from, from can, the Swiss mathematician. Oh, and by the way, Cantor, for those that don't know, was hounded into an insane asylum by a colleague who said that infinity is the realm of God and doesn't belong in the realm of, of mathematics, that it's a philosophical concept. And if you're trying to put infinity on solid mathematical axiomatic ground, then you're a tool of Satan and you belong in an insane asylum. And that's actually where Cantor ended up and died. So I don't know if there's some lesson to be learned there. I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> so. I looked at this, but I looked at this picture, and immediately I was freaked out because I'm thinking about using this, this TI calculator here after a cat has been pawing at the keyboard, right? Everybody know about Toxoplasma gondii? Have you heard of this? If you have, if you've had a, if you have a, a wife and she's pregnant, she's not allowed to touch the litter box because of this parasite, a single-celled parasite. So this cat saying, hmm, actually it's not the cat, it's the, it's the Toxoplasma gondii that the cat is infected with. This single-celled parasite loves mammalian intestinal tracts. That's where it reproduces. And it does everything that it can to get back into the, uh, as one writer on the internet put it, the hot day glow sex lounge of the mammalian internet, uh, intestinal tract, right? <laughs> so it's doing everything that it can to be able to do that. And it doesn't care who the, what the mammal is, but cats are a uniquely uh, uh, useful host to Toxoplasma gondii. And so something happens uh, when a mammal becomes infected with Toxoplasma gondii. They, the, the parasite actually rewires the mammalian brain. And in, in rats, rats will do this crazy thing where they become no longer, not only do they become not afraid of cats, they, they, they seek out, when they detect the, the aroma of cat urine, they seek it out. They go find it. Where's that cat urine smell coming from? I can't wait to find out the source. And of course, they get to the source, and it's a cat. And then they get eaten. And that's the purpose. That's the point, right? The, then the Toxoplasma gondii gets back into the intestines of the cat, and the whole, the beautiful cycle of life starts over again. Well, the internet exists primarily to propagate cat videos. <laughs> so you see where I'm going with this, right? Not only is all the things that John talked about, I mean, geez, you can't get any darker than the internet being just like Cthulhu's lair, like we're waiting for the dark gods to like reappear on the internet. Well, I, that's, that's way more grim, I guess, but, but there are not only the, the, uh, the virtual infections on the internet, it, it appears that there may actually be a, a real infection, in Toxoplasma gondii, cybernetic malware. And for those who haven't seen Toxoplasma gondii oocysts, there they are, having their fun. Okay, so here's my case study. This is an amalgam. It's based on a number of enterprises that I've worked with who've done address plans. There's actually a couple of corporations in particular. So this is a fictional corporation that's sort of eliding who the actual uh, uh, victims are here that I've, that I've picked on. But the business is, it's a very large um, enterprise based on a very, a, a large, very real enterprise. <clears throat> Based in the U.S., manufacturing, quite old, Fortune 500, 150 facilities on six continents and 65,000 employees. And then the network looks something like this. Headquarter campus in U.S., 18 data centers, 60 manufacturing plants, 300 regional offices. All stitched together over MPLS Enterprise WAN and some regional internet connectivity um, per region. So right away, the, the enterprise goes out and, and does the right thing and gets a large enough allocation for each of the locations. Africa, Asia, um, fr from APNIC, from APNIC rather, AFRNIC and uh, LACNIC, and in particular the, the local internet registry in Brazil and LACNIC, a slash 32 from each of those, a slash 31 here in North America from Aaron, and a slash 29 in, in Europe. So they did the right thing. They went out and got a sufficiently large enough block to support wherever their operations are. So there's some, there's some discussion and confusion about what routing policy will end up looking like 
for the internet at large going forward, whether or not we'll continue to honor slash 48 as the smallest routable prefix, whether that's going to result in prefix disaggregation that causes um, the, the issue of the routing table to grow too large. Uh, these are certainly concerns, um, but they're not going to be solved by the enterprise that's doing its address plan. Um, and so in general, the recommendation to get a large block and to get PI space is, is the one that that led this particular enterprise to get this complement of IPv6 address space. So they did this exercise of sort of breaking things down into uh, using the nibble boundaries here very clearly, the regional block followed by a large site block in the form of a slash 40, uh, a normal size block in the, in the form of a slash 48, and then all jumping all the way down to the, uh, the interface level. And then what that ended up looking like, and just in terms of breaking it out, regional slash 32, uh, several sites, like maybe say, not several, but two or three, um, fewer than 10 extra large sites in, that, that get slash 40s. In each of those, you can map slash 48 functions, although they hadn't actually done that in their address plan to this point. They left that as future work. And then uh, smaller sites with a slash 48 jumping immediately to the slash 64 level for the interfaces. And then the actual addresses that get plugged in there. So a campus allocation of a slash 40 for one of those extra large sites and that site contains a manufacturing plant or one or more manufacturing plants, one or more data centers, and the corporate, camp, the corporate LAN. And each of those is getting, in this case, a slash 44 that can be further broken down, say, with the data centers into slash 48s for each of the data centers. Now, what they did from there was, once they had the high-level sort of map, they just did a, a site template. So again, the idea is not that you have a unique address plan for every possible site and every possible way in which that site uh, ends up being deployed in terms of the hardware and the software that's, that's uh, deployed at that particular location. The idea, and, and so in other words, you'd, you'd be back to that exercise of sort of shrinking and growing the size of the site allocation based on the size of the site that you have. And a little bit of that's okay if I have you know, three sites in the, the network that are extremely large and I need them to have a larger allocation. Um, maybe I don't want to give every site down to the regional office a slash 40. And, and there's some, there's some, that makes some sense because you're thinking in terms of consuming a total number of slash 48s, which you have either 16 or 256 of. So that's a very different calculation than a v4 address plan where you're looking at the number of host addresses that are consumed. So within the site allocation, there's a data center site template that basically says I've got a slash 48 for the data center. I'm going to go ahead and peel off where I need some hierarchy for application pods or tenants. I'm going to peel off a slash 60, and I'm going to hold a bunch of reserve uh, address space in reserve. And then each of my uh, slash 60s, I'm going to go ahead and have 16 uh, uh, slash 64s to number the VLANs. So uh, the number of slash 60s I'd have to play, play around with in each um, data center site would be 4,096. And maybe that makes sense for that particular enterprise. It's not a one-size-fits-all model. So we're able to articulate at a very high level just the allocation that was received from the rears, what an extra large site would get, and these are extra large sites that have you know, multiple functions, corporate campus, data center, manufacturing facilities, standard sites, which could be a standalone campus, a standalone data center, a regional office, or a, a standalone manufacturing facility would get a slash 48. And then site templates are going to provide the hierarchy for campuses, data center, regional office, and manufacturing facilities. And again, there's a, with the site template, it's sort of a one-size-fits-all notion, but the idea is that the largest entity, the largest network component, the largest site that has a particular network complement, uh, that's going to sort of set the bar for where that, that assignment is. If I make it a slash 48, that that's future-proofs me in terms of making sure I can always connect that site to the Internet. A slash 52 will be reserved at locations not using a site template, and slash 64s may be, may be assigned monotonically until later when they decide they want to add some hierarchy within that site. So it's, it's very straightforward. Operational, an operations view of the network relies on a well-defined organizational entities that are tied to location and role. And in this case, they're going to use either a slash 40 or a slash 48. And the larger allocation for the largest of the network entities drove the need to go back and get, or initially, um, I think they said when they started out, they had just a slash, they had a single slash 40 from Aaron, and then they had to go back and get a slash 29 from Aaron along with allocations from each of the regional internet registries. And again, that's the opposite of choosing a smaller prefix to accommodate a smaller initial allocation. 
So some things that will impact this, IoT deployments clearly, IPv6 addressing for containers, and, and I don't know what this, you know, in, in, terms of, in terms of the basic calculation of the number of slash 48s that are being consumed, every, that, that approach, that methodology can be plugged into whatever we end up with in the future in terms of IoT or hybrid data center, private data center, I'm sorry, hybrid cloud or private cloud for enterprise, um, container networking, et cetera. And there's this IPv6 address planning book on O'Reilly if you're uh, interested in, in reading even more. I don't have the uh, Toxoplasma gondii digression in there, though, so. <laughs> anyway, that's all I had for today. Any uh, questions based on what I've talked about so far? And uh, can you hold till, till we get the microphone? Oh, yeah, sure. What was the type of bird on your bus? Good question. Um, it's, a, it's a pander's ground jay that's native to Kazakhstan. And, and that was my question when I, when I went with O'Reilly, when O'Reilly accepted my proposal. I was like, what kind of animal am I going to get? What can I do? You know, they're very, they're very sort of, you know, like they're, they don't care anymore. They just like every one of their books has an animal on it. So they're just like, you, you know, they're, first of all, they're like, you get what you get. You, you, it's long past the time when you can pick the animal that you, you know, want on the cover of your book because we've already gone through the entire, you know, Linnaeus table of taxonomic classification for all the animals that are available. So I said, well, will it be a, will it be a mammal? Will it be a bird? Will it be a, like a slug? You know, what is it? You know, actually, no, because Sylvia has, she's got the snail on yes, the IPv6 yes. essentials. Yeah, will it, be, will it be from the kingdom insecta? Will it be from the kingdom mammalia? It, it, they said it's going to be a bird. I'm like, oh, okay, a bird. Hmm, what will it be? Pander's ground jay, native to Kazakhstan. So, good question, though. <laughs> hey, Owen, how you doing? Uh, doing good. Owen DeLong, Akamai. Um, you must have gotten that allocation from Aaron, or that assignment, rather, from Aaron quite a while ago in order to get a 29 or a 31 out of them, because they're doing strictly nibble boundaries nowadays, and that's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Owen brings up a good point. So if I, if I started off with a slash 40 and realized it wasn't large enough and I needed a slash 32, if I realized a slash 32 wasn't large enough, I really should be jumping to a slash 28. And my understanding is that they are holding that nibble boundary in reserve. So then if I, you know, if I decided a slash 32 wasn't going to meet my needs operationally, then I could go back and get a slash 28 from Aaron. Um. Uh, my question is, are we, are we stopping at slash 64 because of the simplicity or there are some hardware and software limitations going further like subnetting wise? Is it? Yeah, it's a hardware limitation, right? Because it's, it's defined in the protocol. If it wasn't defined explicitly in the protocol, and, and sh I'm sure you can hack around this if you know if you were crazy, but you, um, the 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 limit in terms of how the logic gets deployed and how the interface is handling the addressing, and and I'm not a software I'm not a software engineer, so I, I can't go into the details of that. But you just you end up breaking things. You end up breaking things like Slack and and um, stateless stateless DHCP v6, et cetera. So there there that limit is is an actual functional limit. Um, yeah. But having said that, there are instances, and I've run into instances where folks are are peeling off those smaller subnets for reasons of um, security, for reasons of they're doing something very specific within a, a, a contained environment, and they want to use that smaller subnet uh, for a particular purpose. But then, of course, they have to think in terms of the logic that the interface is going to support, and whether that whether or not that's going to break something. So I couldn't take a bunch of off-the-shelf gear that's conforming to the IPv6 RFCs, plug it in, start subnetting to the right of the slash 64, and, and reasonably expect consistent behavior. I might get it, but that might be accidental, and I would never know when that particular limitation would bite me in the behind. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions? Comments? I was gonna add a comment that there are several different protocols that breaks, so that these days that's very dangerous. That was something, probably, I don't know, eight years ago, seven, eight years ago is when they really made that decision to be really firm with the Slash 64. Any other questions? One more question? So, so, so I was just uh, reading uh, the latest RFC say that you should use Slash 127 for peer-to-peer -peer link after saying that you should use Slash 64, so where are we? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was a troll. <laughs> we, so, we so rarely get to see one in meat space. We, we know them online. That could be Cthulhu himself or herself, I don't know. 
Yeah. Well, we can argue about it later. I have no, I seriously have no opinion. I don't care. It's so beyond caring. Any other questions? All right, on that cheerful note, thanks again for everyone's attention and uh, look forward to chatting with you offline. <laughs>